Futurama comic issue 55. The ship's about to crash because it's out of fuel, and it turns out Bender accidentally put licorice jaw breakers in the fuel tank, like the kind Fry was eating, and he had them mixed up. Leela says that luckily they were delivering personal escape pods, so she suggests using them to not die. Wouldn't Farnsworth have put escape pods in his ship? He can invent anything, and if anything happens to his crew, he'd have to go through the effort of hiring and getting to know another crew. Plus, you'd think it'd be illegal not to have escape pods for the same reason you have to have lifeboats. And there would be inspections of Plan Express to make sure he has escape pods. And her ship crashed plenty of times, and they never even had to go to the hospital. But I guess she just assumes they always got lucky, and it was just her expert's piloting skills that saved them. To be fair, there would be a lot less tension if there were always escape pods in Planet Express, because they would always escape from the ship in them. The pods are gonna put them all in suspended animation until they'd land on a habitable world. Which is more advanced technology than Sonic experience in Toss in Space. Someone in a Wild West world threatens someone scared with a gun, and then Fry's pod conveniently lands on a criminal and not the good guy. Fry gets thanked for it when he clearly wouldn't have had any control over how a pod landed. And he shakes his hand, and Fry somehow apologizes even though he thanked him. He wants a phone, but there isn't one on this world. So it's just a happy coincidence that humanity developed here is separate from Earth. And he decides to make Fry the new sheriff right away, after an obvious accident of his that even apologized for. I hope this does enough to distinguish itself from every Wild West fiction ever, because if not, there'd be no reason to read it. Fry says no in that he's roommates with a convicted felon, but somehow he gets made his deputy. At least it's smart of Fry to be uneasy about being hired for the job because he has no experience with it. Well, AOSDH Sonic immediately thought he'd be great at it and was a terrible shot. Fry says just until he gets bored, when really it'd be just until he gets fired for sucking at the job. It's obvious he's only being hired out of desperation. I assume there's no one else applying for the job. Are there that few people in the town? Are people that scared of the high crime rate? On the bright side, Fry's lucky he's getting a job right away on an alien planet he's an illegal immigrant to. At least this will give him money to survive on for a bit, so he's really better off humoring him. And if this planet hasn't even heard of phones, they won't have spaceships to escape the planet. And they might not have the means to find out he's never been on the planet before. Still, while I can understand the writer wanting to write something he doesn't usually write for a change of pace, which is why a Wild West parody was written in Sonic the Comic, I come to Futurama to see sci-fi adventures on alien planets. I already saw the OSTH episode in the Wild West and a Sabrina comic where she went back in time to it. I don't think this would show me anything new and entertaining. Out of complete nowhere, the criminal that Fry's pod landed on is somehow still alive and standing, and tells Fry that his fellow criminals are gonna come burn the town by tomorrow noon. He looks like a human, but he's made of a lot tougher stuff. Somehow Fry says his threats don't scare him, and the sheriff says he wanted to ride away and leave Fry in charge, but he's scared of horses. Well, a horse could buck when you're riding and kill you from throwing you to the ground. So that's smart of him. Somehow Fry tells people that the sheriff's gonna stand up to those criminals tomorrow, but he says he tried to run away, but he's scared of cacti. Even though cacti can't move. Cacti are dangerous, but it could run where the cacti aren't. All you'd have to do is face forwards. It's not like the entire town is surrounded by a wall of cacti, right? If that was true, the criminals would have a lot harder time getting to the town. The sheriff would be confused by Fry saying he's seen a lot of westerns, but he doesn't question him on it in a world without movies. Or maybe some fields of technology developed at different speeds on other worlds, so he does have movies. But that'd be interesting to establish. So no, because this is just a cliché story. He tells the sheriff to practice to get braver, and tells him to shoot these old tin cans off the fence, which I also saw in Adventures of Sonic. At least there I saw it in motion. Fry walks away and then goes back to him later and sees the sheriff shining a can for no reason so the cans won't hurt him. When cans can't hurt him because they're immobile. It's obvious he's seen how crazy 
But Fry has to work for him. And he has to keep trying to train him out of desperation to better his chances. I really wish I was seeing how Bender and Lilo were doing instead of this lazy, cliche ripoff story. The bare minimum the story had to do was feature alien creatures for civilians, or robots. Fry tells the sheriff to practice his quick draw and pull out his gun on the count of three. Shouldn't he be given training too because he's a new deputy? And they don't know if he's gotten experience with a ray gun or not. The sheriff makes the white flag instead for no reason when he's safe during practice. And he did it so fast because he used his underpants. People laugh at him, but would they be any braver in a dangerous situation? Why did he take his job, not one of them? Fry says because he's treating this like a movie as a coping mechanism that what he really needed was to show him the moral of the film. Which is usually to be true to yourself. So he decides to make him the greatest coward there is. He should have had a thought bubble saying that since they're never gonna win in a fight where the two of them try to be brave, they might as well screw around and go in the complete opposite direction because why even try? Some bad guys also named after Bart Simpson show up, though it's not said why they're called that, so it's just a confusing coincidence. They find out the building's already burnt. Unless those are decoy buildings built in a hurry, that's illegal and awful. The sheriff says he was so scared of the criminals doing it that he did it. And it's funny that he's cheerfully smiling and apologizes like it's nothing. He's told they also planned on shooting him, and he shows them a bandage and says he did that too because he was cleaning his gun and got scared by a moth. The criminals conveniently all decide to leave, even though if they live to cause people misery and fear, they'd just shoot him anyways. Weren't they coming here to kill Fry for getting Black Bart arrested? Why wouldn't they still be after Fry? Somehow, Fry's idea worked without him at least getting hurt first. And somehow the townspeople agree that they deserved the town being burned for laughing at him. One of them really has self-loathing issues then. And the donkey's either a donkey or a guy in a costume. Fry says he's gotta find his friends, as if there's any logical chance of that. Then someone sings about beer while in a pod, so I guess it's Bender. It crashes and he catches a thrown Molotov cocktail and gets in the truck with people who don't appreciate his presence. Bender burps fire at the guy they hate, and the truck drives off a cliff, so they thank Bender, while probably assuming he's just a big fan of cosplaying as a robot, and bought an expensive robot mask that can have its mouth move like Bender's. Or as people are already familiar with robots. The truck stops at the Thunderdome gated community, and the guy threatens in order to get in with an outdated password. How convenient that he got in. He says he's always been the angry one in his family, and he reveals that he has brothers called Sad Max, Plaid Max, and Rad Max. So this is ripping off a movie called Mad Max. Too bad it's not something the writer thought up himself. At least I never experienced the story of Mad Max. Bender's told they're all hiding from a guy who controls the desert, and Bender bumps into Master Blaster and insults him, which offends him. And he goes from offering to apologize to apologizing sarcastically and insulting him again. Is he a coward or not? This is the same guy that was screaming hysterically from danger, even though the whole time he thought he had a backup system. So he's challenged to a battle in the Thunder Spear, which reminds me of one of the most needlessly gory episodes of Rick and Morty. Bender grabs a weapon, and it cuts ahead two hours later, where Bender is still reading the manual. And Blaster says this takes triple Z batteries that he's never heard of. So they don't even remember why they're fighting anymore because they had such a petty reason to start feuding. But since the rules say that one enters and one leaves, Blaster is declared the winner, and then reveals he was hiding Bender in him. And Bender is right back to being able to walk just fine when he looked weird before. I'm glad there was a twist that wouldn't have happened in the movie. Bender says as far as post-apocalyptic wastelands go, he'd give this place a 4. And he says he'll say it's out of 5 if that makes the guy feel any better. But that guy would know he's just humoring him because he said that. And since when does Bender care enough to humor someone because it's smarter to play nice? He wants to know where the nearest exit is, and he doesn't want him to go because Bender could be their leader. Even though what impressed him about him was his ability to breathe fire. Which means combat skills. A soldier. It turns out the guy only really wants to direct movies, which apparently still exists in a post-apocalyptic town. They all want to make him leader, and he accepts when they hold him over their heads. And then someone says to send out their leader to be killed. 
And he somehow says he doesn't envy that poor guy, when he should know the leader's hem now. And he's tossed in front of the bad guys' minivans. He says some stupid stuff for no reason in a pathetic attempt to get them to leave. And somehow the guy who was set on fire is still alive for no reason to tell the bad guy it's Bender. Bender wastes time and because his dialogue was so scared, the bad guys say they'll destroy the whole city with a catapult instead. But if they were this evil, wouldn't they have wanted to do that anyways? Bender doesn't care that these people will be enslaved and made homeless, but when he's told he'll shut down their beer bottling plant, rather than putting someone from his town in charge of it, he says this means war. I guess the reason you need one to shut it down is that it's against beer in general. One of the bad guys says he's ready to fire, as in cut the rope and fling the boulder. Bender comes up with a plan on the spot, saying he came to apologize for what his friend Max wrote about them on that rock. Which is probably something he wrote instead, because it calls this guy gullible as he stands on the catapult to make out the last word. Then Bender flings both of them away, and the bad guy's leader goes in front of him with a jetpack and chases after him. But it's goofy that Bender is magically able to run faster than he can fly. Bender goes into a building that looks as small as a porta potty and escapes through the chimney while the bad guy is in there and closes the door. And because it has explosives and the bad guy's a jetpack, the place explodes. With the shockwave conveniently not destroying Bender, or even fleeing him forwards harmlessly like series do to pretend they're being realistic with explosions. Then we see that the bad guy somehow survived that. What's with bad guys surviving for no reason in this comic? It's a comic about a relentlessly dark, cynical future, not something for kids. Bender sees a coyote holding a sign saying he gives up out of nowhere like Wile E. Coyote. Why are they allowed to have him have a cameo without owning him or clearly parodying him? It's just playing him straight. And as I wonder where he got that sign on such short notice, I also wonder why he took so long to fall off the cliff. I guess he has the magical power to levitate subconsciously for a few seconds, and then he runs out of magic. Meanwhile, Leela thinks the world she landed on is a beautiful forest with giant mushrooms. Oh no, it's an Avatar ripoff. I was worried that this wouldn't be creative either. Why can't the story of even one subplot be original? A blue guy thanks her for complimenting the forest and has some insensitive dialogue where he's shocked that her parents let her live when she can't see 3D. Leela's so used to being insulted for being a Cyclops that she doesn't complain about it. But what's unrealistic is that she's not even looking annoyed. It's like it doesn't even affect her. The guy says he's named Cameroon, reminding me of a place in real life. And his people are called the Naive because they believe everything they're told. Why would he tell her that? But Leela's well-intentioned enough to tell him they should stop doing that. Then there's an explosion behind them, which throws him ahead too, but somehow doesn't kill him. Because then he wants to be able to tell Leela exposition about the machine that caused the explosion. I never saw Avatar. She's told about mercenaries trying to mine under his trees to look for an ore with a silly name, and thankfully Leela lampshades that the name sounds made up. Which is already better writing than the movie because it's trying to be funny, and is more realistic, instead of taking itself too seriously. She's told that the ore is going to be used to blow up two specific alien species. Leela somehow thinks bunnies and squirrels can mate together and isn't corrected. She says her company has a prime directive policy from Star Trek, and fortunately explains that they don't follow that rule before I can point that very thing out. Wasn't it pointed out that Bender just made that up? And Leela didn't say anything about that. If they were breaking a rule every time, then Hermes would have fired them a long time ago. Or been forced to. He says that first he'll train her to ride the mighty dragon as I start wondering why he's trusting Leela when she's of a different species and he never saw another species of people before. And the whole reason the protagonist of Avatar made himself able to control the body of a Navi was to gain their trust. At least Leela not doing this is unique and creative, so the story has an actual point to existing. She's told that once she chooses a dragon, she'll be connected until she trades them in. But their values somehow reduce by half the second they leave the lot. The one on the right looks terrible, with a goofy head, nothing like a dragon. The dragon doesn't like her, but she's told she just has to plug her ponytail into him. She realistically says, say what now? And gets told that all living things are connected through the naive's ponytails. Even though ponytails aren't plugs. She agrees, but says it makes her want to shampoo for a week, since it purrs at her. 
How would it work when she does it? He calls his people and tells them she's ready to lead them into battle, even though she's not. And as I wonder how he'd trust a stranger of another species to be the leader of an army right away, she screams at all the lasers and compliments her war cry, which is a believable mistake of him to make. While it's surprising because Leela's supposed to be a badass, at least it's realistic and relatable of her to be terrified. The Colonel tells them to surrender from an intercom in the machine, and Leela can't control the dragon, which is realistic for a first-timer, I suppose. So she gets sent through a window, but somehow doesn't immediately die or at least get injured from the glass flying into her. Instead, she can kick a human just fine, and somehow she's mistaken for one of the naive, despite looking nothing like them. Maybe he just assumes she's a mutated version of them, or a specific ethnicity of the naive. But assuming she was a different species entirely would make more sense. The guy reveals he doesn't even think that ore is real, and we see the human army in front of Leela and the Naive. The guy says they weren't after any minerals, and were just told to keep the Naive scared, but if the Naive had relaxed, they would have let their hair down. In a creative twist, it turns out the so-called army works for the largest suppliers of scrunchies in the universe. In the Naive are a huge market that were wanted to keep needing their ponytails to plug into fighting dragons and weapons. He shakes his hand, making up with them, and he tells them to get him to a hospital for his gruesome injury and they'll call it even. Then he's so panicked that he tells her to take him to the ICU, which he apparently knows exists, which is also creative. She's understandably confused at first because he was so scared that he just said a four-word sentence at first. So Leela gets told by the nurse that it'll be fine because spare legs grow on trees here. Bender sees Leela and pretends to not know her name to be sarcastic, and Frybender and Leela reunite, with Frybin hugging Leela without being insulted. It turns out they all landed on the same world, but the pods went into different orbits, so they landed a few days apart. It's certainly more realistic that they'd land on the same world because they all went into pods that were really close to each other and launched at the same time, so the nearest planet to each pod would be the same one for each other. I just don't know why the pods didn't all fly in the same direction and stick right beside each other. Fortunately, we get to find out more information about the aftermath of Fry and Bender's adventures. Fry says that the townspeople want his advice and he told them to build a huge wall around this place in case they're attacked again. But that'd take forever. I also thought of the fact that someone could just dig a tunnel under a wall anyways because it's a desert. But there could be guards stationed to hear anyone digging. There'd have to be a lot of them. And since horses are too slow if you need to get away, Fry told them to invent cars. And so they did. And that's when Bender landed. They invented cars awfully fast. I guess there was a super genius among them. I wish I saw that. Bicycles would have been more believable. Bender says he was sick of the jerks who wanted him to be the leader and told them that he wanted their deserts himself. They wouldn't have anywhere to live. So he told them to keep walking until they'd find a forest. So they did and they turned blue and miraculously didn't die from the poisonous wild plants they'd have to eat without knowing what's edible. And it's charming that the blue guy has a smile while saying that it felt good to wear these casual clothes and let their tails out to breathe. She asks why they're blue, but did they always have tails? I guess they always hid their tails with pants and stuff. I find it confusing that they're all the same people. Because why would they turn blue? Well, thankfully that's explained. They covered themselves in blue spray paint to blend in with the plants as camouflage. And she naturally says they should have used green paint, clearly the only smart option. But the blue paint was on sale. Okay, that's really stupid. Just have them be two separate species, or a wizard did it, would be less insulting. It turns out they only lived in the woods for two weeks, and the people of this planet change their way of life instantly based on what any outsider tells them. Fry explains that he ran into Bender when he was dying of thirst on his own desert walk after he was left outside of the new wall. Which probably happens because he fell asleep. But the person building it would have warned him. Unless they all got sick of his stupidity. I wish we saw them reunite and him fall asleep. Bender says he was there to sell him some beer that he should have given to him for free. Then the naive guy shows them their ship. It was a mess. But his whole civilization banded together to fix and refuel it, because apparently they're smart enough to do that when they just invented cars. They really do have a super genius among them. He was just too lazy to do anything to help until recently. 
Just as I got suspicious of how well this was going for them, it turns out they only want to get the crew off the planet because they can't survive any more of their stupid advice. How is their advice stupid? Fry had a really good point in telling them to invent cars, and maybe they needed the wall to protect them from criminals. It turns out this is the hundredth planet the crew was banned from, and somehow Leela naively assumes that they got an entire world to work together in peace forever. Fry says they learned that the only thing worse than death and war was them trying to help them. And he says it's a good feeling, which seems stupid at first, but makes sense when you realize that he thinks it's a good feeling because it reassures him that he doesn't have to feel obligated to expend the effort of helping, because it might not be appreciated. I feel like this story lasted forever. This boring story was about the crew being separated in escape pods and living through separate adventures, which sadly rip off the plots of movies instead of being fully creative. So good thing it's not completely boring by having the plots be identical to them. Instead, each adventure has some creative twists to it that are more charming and self-aware than the actual plots. So I appreciated the twist endings for that alone. Fry's plot really bored me by ripping off every western ever. Bender's plot ripped off Mad Max when I already saw it in an episode of Rick and Morty. So seeing the Thunderdome was hard to take seriously when it already looks unrealistic. Could a post-apocalyptic society really have the resources and time to build that thing? At least I didn't have to see any horrible-looking mutants, like in Rick and Morty. And Leela's plot seemed to be based on Avatar. The ending takes advantage of them having ponytails. And there's a twist where the crew were all on the same planet all along. And it's even explained that they all changed their lifestyles depending on the whim of an outsider really easily. Overall, it was lame and underwhelming that instead of having a more intriguing story where they explore an alien planet that could have been like anything, instead of giving us new experiences, the stories ripped off movies that are so well known that I recognize them on sight. It's a safer bet to rip off movies people won't recognize so that it still looks new.